Well, hello everyone. I'm Don, Don Eastead, one of the founders of the 14 Mile Watershed Committee. I'd like to wish you all a good afternoon and welcome to our Water Week event, which we have titled An Introduction to the New 14 Mile Watershed Alliance. Our facilitator for today's event is Rachel Whitehair, our UW Extension Natural Resources Agent. If you have a question or technical issue, please alert her via the chat window at the bottom of your screen and she can help you. Next slide, please. So looking at the map on your screen, you see the 14 mile watershed that begins east of Plainfield, Wisconsin on the right side of your screen and ends at Lake Petenwell in the town of Rome on the left. Over 23 million gallons of water flow through this watershed on average every day. So take a moment and notice the four counties in the watershed. There's Washera County, Portage, Wood, and Adams County, and also the 55,000 acres of mixed land use throughout. The blue lines on the map show uh, indicate creeks and ditches that feed the watershed, and about 40% of the watershed is fed by groundwater. The watershed is shared by municipal, agricultural, and residential recreational users. Notice the group of lakes at the bottom of the watershed in Adams County. They'd be on your left. Those are the Tri Lakes, Lakes Arrowhead, Camelot, and Sherwood. They're man made lakes developed in the late 1960s by damming the 14 Mile Creek. The town of Rome has built a thriving recreational residential community of about 7,000 people around these lakes since then. Just over four years ago, we became alarmed when pets died and people became ill after exposure to blue-green algae in our lakes here in Rome. Next. With the support of Tri Lakes, our Lake Management Association, we formed a citizen-led committee with representatives from each of our three lakes and advisors from Adams County Land and Water and the Department of Natural Resources. Our town of Rome added their support and expanded our footprint to all waters in the town, including Lake Petenwell, where the 14 mile empties into the Wisconsin River Basin. We named ourselves the 14 Mile Watershed Joint Committee. Our objective at the time was to identify the cause of the water quality issues and to find a solution to the blue green algae problem in our lakes. Little did we know just how complex an issue we were dealing with. Though often referred to as algae, blue-green algae are not algae at all, but types of bacteria called cyanobacteria. They are normally present in most bodies of water and common in our waterways. This type of bacteria thrives in warm, phosphorus, and nitrogen-rich water. When conditions are right, the blue-green algae can grow quickly, forming blooms. Certain varieties of blue-green algae can produce toxins that are linked to illness in humans and animals. And that's exactly what we experienced. With guidance from our advisors, our primary approach was to understand and to begin resolving our own contributions to the water quality issue within our lakes before we approached our upstream 14 mile watershed neighbors. We began a testing program that would provide scientifically credible data pointing us towards a solution. Next, please. We worked with town officials and local professional fertilizer applicators to adopt more stringent guidelines for our fertilizer ordinance for lakefront properties. And we recognized our supportive neighbors with a clean water cooperator sign. Our committee embraced the DNR's Healthy Lakes Grant Initiative with over 50 lake area projects in process or completed in the past four years. These projects reduce nutrient runoff and soil erosion and they improve habitat for fish. We perform soil tests all around our lakes area to identify the lo level of legacy phosphorus that exists in our shoreland properties. And that tells us the effect of erosion from our lake shores. We expanded the state's citizen lake monitoring program beyond just phosphorus and chlorophyll to include nitrogen. Next slide, please. 
That allows us to compare in-lake nutrient loads to upstream nutrient loads and to better understand the differences at inlets and outlets and whether our lakes are nutrient contributors or settling ponds for nutrients from elsewhere. And we've tested for flow and nutrients upstream in the watershed in various locations these past 40 months following a structured process and utilizing sophisticated equipment and certified lab testing to provide scientific data that helps us to know the impact of the upstream ditch network and the groundwater that flows into it. And did I mention that all this has been done by volunteers? So what have we learned these past four years? There is no easy solution, no magic pill or process that will instantly reduce phosphorus and nitrogen in the watershed. Next, please. With 23.4 million gallons flowing through the watershed on average each day, the solution has to be a watershed-wide solution involving all four counties. We know that water quality is important to all stakeholders in the watershed. There are at least 30 producer-led watershed councils in Wisconsin, farmers leading the efforts to clean up the water. It's not just about us recreational users. Many of our upstream neighbors grow cranberries and row crops dependent on clean water. And all of us drink from the groundwater, so we all have to be a part of the solution. Next slide. The 14 Mile Committee, Tri Lakes, and our town has been honored with the state's DNR Secretary Director's Award for outstanding service in support of the DNR's natural resource mission. We appreciate the recognition. It's a credit to all the citizens and advisors who serve on this committee, and it's an inspiration for us to keep working. We were very successful this year working with our advisors to apply for grants to support our programs. Over $250,000 was awarded by the DNR for grants that support the entire 14 mile watershed and our lakes. That's a quarter of a million dollars, folks. Also, we recently received EPA and DNR approval for the Nike element plan for restoration of the 30 plus mile long, four county, 55,000 acre watershed. This is a 10 year, $8 million plan involving more than 50 stakeholder groups throughout the watershed. Next. It was a two and a half year process spearheaded by our Adams County conservationist, Case and Morley, and the DNR's Andrew Craig, and the first nine key element plan to include both surface water and groundwater for nitrogen. It's a structured process focusing on milestone activities for education, municipalities, agriculture stakeholders, and shoreland stakeholders. It's the driving force behind our group's expanded mission statement and goals, and the driver for us to expand and reorganize as a nonprofit to make our group more open and welcoming to all stakeholders from Plainfield on down to Petenwell. As a nonprofit, we'll have better access to funds to support all milestone activities of the Nike Element Plan up and down the watershed. So welcome to the new 14 Mile Watershed Alliance. Sit back and enjoy hearing about our key programs from my fellow committee members, beginning with John Andreese. We've reserved time at the end for your questions, so feel free to use the chat feature to send a question and we'll catalog them for our wrap up. Thank you very much for joining us today. John Andreese. Thanks, Don. Water sampling is a task that our team performs for the 14 Mile Watershed Alliance each month. March testing will mark the 40th month that we have submitted samples. The samples are sent to the State Lab of Hygiene for analysis. The flow results are input into the Surface Water Integrated Monitoring System, also known as the SWIMS database. SWIMS holds a wide variety of river and stream data, including baseline, targeted and evaluation monitoring, grant projects, grant final reports, and watershed planning work. Additionally, the results are shared with DNR Water Resources Specialist, Taylor Haas. Let's look at the parameters. Nitrate, nitrites are common components of fertilizers. Almost all inorganic nitrates are soluble in water. High nitrate levels in drinking water are hot hazardous to human health and they've been found to increase algae growth. Total Keldal nitrogen is the sum of ammonia 
nitrogen plus organically bound nitrogen. The total phosphorus test measures all forms of phosphorus in the exam in the samples, I'm sorry. A source of chlorides in groundwater is fertilizer made with potash or mined salts. Potassium chloride is the salt most commonly used in potash fertilizer. Potassium is one of the three essential nutrients along with nitrogen and phosphorus that are added to increase soil fertility on farms, home gardens, and lawns. Like nitrogen and phosphorus, chloride can leach from fertilized soils into the rivers and streams. Dissolved oxygen is the amount of gaseous oxygen dissolved in the water. Oxygen enters the water by direct absorption from the atmosphere, by water movement, or as a waste product uh, by plant photosynthesis. Water temperature and the volume of moving water can affect dissolved oxygen levels. pH is the measure of acid base content of water. Not only does the pH of a stream affect organisms living in the water, a changing pH in a stream can be an indicator of increased pollution or some other environmental factor. Temperature is a critical water quality and environmental par parameter because it governs the kinds and types of aquatic life, regulates the maximum dissolved oxygen concentration of the water, and influences the rate of chemical and biological reaction. Water clarity provides a visual indication of the condition of water. It is affected by a number of physical, chemical, and biological factors that are connected to the natural geology and human use of the surrounding watershed. Some waters are naturally turbid. However, waters that receive excessive inputs of nutrients, such as fertilizer runoff and sediments, for example, from construction runoff, are generally less clear and more turbid. Water clarity is measured visually with an instrument called a Secchi tube. Total suspended solids are particles larger than two microns that are found in the water column. Total suspended solids are a significant factor in observing water quality. Flow is measured in cubic feet per second. When combined with grams per liter, that the chemical results are reported in yield a weight per volume value uh, at that test location. Testing takes place at nine locations on the 14 mile watershed. Currently, there are two testing elements missing from our suite. They are habitat assessment and biotic index. Habitat assessment is the evaluation of the structure of surrounding physical habitat that influence the quality of water resource and the condition of the resident aquatic community. Biotic index is a scale for showing the quality of an environment by indicating the types of organisms present in it. It's often used to assess the quality of water in rivers. Uh, it is measured on a one to 10 scale and corresponds to the four basic ratings, excellent, good, fair, and poor. Currently, water sampling team counts just two, two members that is. If any of you folks are interested in joining our testing program, we'd be very happy to welcome you. Citizen Lake Monitoring is another facet of the 14 Mile Watershed Committee's science-driven programs. Phil Rockenbach heads up this group. Here's Phil to tell about this form of water testing. Hello. I'm Phil Rockenbach, and I would like to share with you a summary of the water testing program on the three lakes located in the 14-mile watershed. I will briefly describe where we test, how we test, what we test, and then review some test results. And finally, discuss where we will be heading in the future with respect to lake water testing. There are three impoundment lakes in the 14-mile watershed. These lakes, Lake Camelot, Lake Sherwood, and Lake Arrowhead, were created in the 1960s by damming the 14-mile creek, which flows east to west through the watershed. The lakes lie at the western edge of the 14-mile watershed 
and drain into Lake Petenwell and the Wisconsin River, about two miles west of the lakes. The three lakes are each about 300 acres in size and are used primarily for recreation, including boating, swimming, and fishing. Numerous homes are situated on the three lakes, all with septic systems. The land upstream of these lakes in the watershed is primarily used for cranberry farming, row crop farming, and for cattle grazing. The upper map on this slide shows a view of the entire watershed. The lower map on the slide is an expanded view of the lake's area. The red bars indicate the location of the dams on each lake. The yellow dots indicate the places where we collect the water samples for testing. Volunteer water sampling teams are assigned to each lake. These teams collect water samples each month from May through October. The teams follow the Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network protocols for collecting and processing the water samples. After collection and onshore processing, this, the water samples are packed in ice and shipped to the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene for analysis. After analysis, the results are sent back to us by email and we then enter those results into the Wisconsin Surface Water Integrated Monitoring System, known as SWIMS. We participate in the Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network, or CLMN, and collect the standard water data from May through August, which includes total phosphorus, chlorophyll, water clarity, uh, via the Secchi disk, water temperature, and observed water color and quality. The CLMN data that we collect is indicated in red on this slide. Because we know that phosphorus and nitrogen are the two primary nutrients contributing to algae formation in the lakes, several years ago we added collection of nitrogen samples to our test suite. At the same time, we extended the collection of phosphorus samples into September and October. Our teams collect the CLMN samples and they also collect water samples to be analyzed for total nitrogen and Keldahl nitrogen levels. These nitrogen samples and the extended phosphorus sampling are shown in blue in the table. Also shown in blue are the E. coli samples we take bi-weekly on Lake Sherwood. E. coli on Lakes Camelot and Lake Arrowhead County beaches are taken by the Adams County Land and Water Department. There is no county beach on Lake Sherwood, so our committee has responsibility for E. coli sampling on that lake. We are interested in determining the source of any high E. coli readings we may encounter. So we have arranged with the USDA lab in Marshfield to run source DNA tests on any high E. coli readings we may receive. This slide shows historical data for the three lakes taken from the SWIMS database. The data shown are trophic state index values for total phosphorus, chlorophyll, and Secchi disk water clarity readings for the period from 1986 through 2020. The Trophic State Index, or TSI, is a classification system designed to rate water bodies based on the amount of biological productivity they sustain. The trophic state of a water body can be one of three classifications, oligotrophic, mesotrophic, or eutrophic. Oligotrophic water bodies with a trophic index of 0 to 40 have the least amount of biological productivity and are considered good water quality. Mesotrophic water bodies have a TSI value of 40 to 60 and have a moderate level of biological productivity. They are considered to be fair water quality. And lastly, the eutrophic water bodies have a TSI of 60 through 100 and have the highest amount of biological productivity. They are considered poor water quality. 
The green area in the figures represents the eutrophic region. The light blue area is the mesotrophic region, and the dark blue is the oligotrophic area. Our three lakes are all classified as borderline eutrophic, meaning that excess nutrients in the lakes promote vigorous growth of aquatic plant life that may cause reduced levels of dissolved oxygen and will promote frequent algae blooms. In fact, ex excess nutrients, primarily phosphorus and nitrogen, in the form of nitrates from lake-based sources such as septic systems, improper use of lawn fertilizer, and legacy phosphorus, as well as nutrients from upstream activities, have resulted in frequent algae blooms in the lake channels and bays during the summer months. Our lakes have also experienced beach closures at times due to elevated levels of E. coli. So where do we go from here? Last year, a comprehensive 10-year, $8 million plan to improve ground and surface water within our watershed, known as the 14-mile watershed nine key element plan, was approved by the EPA. We expect to continue our lake water testing in support of this plan as our testing efforts provide valuable nutrient load and information required by the plan. As we say, the hard work is just beginning. Next up is Dave Trudeau to discuss our Healthy Lakes programs. Thank you, Phil. Good afternoon. My name is Dave Trudeau, and I'm a citizen volunteer coordinator for the DNR Healthy Lakes Grant Program in our watershed. I want to share my involvement in implementing the Healthy Lakes Grant Program. Some of your specific questions may need to be redirected to the DNR since they administer this grant program. Uh, Rachel, can you bring up the first slide? There we go. Uh, this, this is the Healthy Lakes uh, website for, for your reference. Um, there are five practices which promote runoff infiltration, reduce sediments and nutrients from reaching near, nearby water bodies. These practices are 350 square foot native plantings, rain gardens, runoff diversion, rock infiltration, and fish sticks. The Healthy Lakes Grant offers a 75% match up to a $1,000 reimbursement for each practice. The landowner's 25% share can include volunteer in-kind labor, which is valued at $12 an hour. To qualify, a property must be lakefront, riparian, or have a direct drainage connection to a water body. Next. The 350 square foot native planting is the most popular practice. There are six pre-approved plant mixes in the technical guide to choose from. In our area, most homeowners, homeowners choose the deer resistant mix. That's followed in popularity by the bird and butterfly mix and then the low growing mix. Next. The 350 square foot planting has to be, has to be a contiguous area that's a minimum of 10 feet wide, but in meeting that criteria, there are several possible configurations. Next. The mixes offer a good diversity of plant species, structure, and color along your shoreline. Next. You may sign up for multiple practices and can install more than one native planting and get the $1,000 reimbursement for each and every 350 square foot area. Next. Rain gardens are installed to catch runoff along a steep slope from a natural swale, a downspout, and they hold that for uh, hold that water for ground in, for ground infiltration. Next, the plant varieties for rain gardens are able to tolerate short-term flooding. Next, like the native plantings, a rain garden will also have a diversity of species, structure, and color. Next. The water diversion practice covers runoff from a sloped area, downspout, or impervious area like a driveway and steers that flow toward an infiltration area. Here is an example of a short diversion which empties into a rain garden. 
Next. Rock infiltration practice can be a creative design like this pathway, or it can capture larger runoff events from driveways, downspouts, or roof drip lines with the infiltration zone designed as a trench or even an underground infiltration pit. Next. Fish sticks are the last practice. This practice creates shoreline fish habitat for feeding and spawning areas. Trees are layered in bundles, tied together, and anchored to the shore. Next. You can use anchors like these duck build anchors, which are driven four foot underground using a five foot long driving rod attached to a jackhammer. If you have a large existing tree along the shore, you can attach your cable around that tree. Next. I've done fish sticks installations three times, putting out 56, 80, and 70 trees. On a larger project like this, a contractor with the right equipment is absolutely invaluable. I've cut trees to about 30 foot lengths and hired a contractor to load and haul them, haul them near a lake. And from that point, uh, then they're hauled out onto the ice by volunteers. Next. We've been working on an island that's owned by the state of Wisconsin and just finished putting fish sticks on every portion of the island where we can. There are some shoreline not available as we're required to maintain 150 foot navigational clearance. After our volunteer efforts working on this public land for three years, we're now getting interest in private landowners wanting to install fish sticks on their own shore. Because the fish sticks end up being submerged along shore after the ice goes out, you must work with your local DNR fisheries biologist to obtain a DNR, DNR permit for a fish sticks project. Next, be sure to visit the Healthy Lakes website for more information and to view the general information and technical guides. Contact Pam Toshner to get your questions answered about installing a Healthy Lakes practice on your property. On the website, there's also a list of your local DNR program biologist who can review your ideas and give technical advice. If you're awarded a Healthy Lakes grant, you have over two and a half years to complete it. The grants that were awarded two weeks ago have until December 2023 to complete the projects and turn in receipts for reimbursement. The next Healthy Lakes application deadline is November 1st, of 2021. The Healthy Lakes grant is for individual properties, but the application must be submitted by a qualifying government entity, lake organization, or nonprofit. We've been applying for grants to the Tri Lakes Management District, but in the future, we expect to be applying as the 14 Mile Watershed Alliance nonprofit. We've seen the program grow from four projects in 2020 in 2016 to 25 projects awarded a couple of weeks ago for 2021. And that was the largest Healthy Lakes grant awarded in the state this round. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Carson Heineke, who will speak about our fertilizer application and clean water cooperative programs. Thank you, Dave. I'm Carson Heineke, and I've been a property owner on Lake Camelot for uh, 42 years now, since 1978. The Healthy Lakes objective is to improve water quality in our town's lakes and streams realizing there are a number of contributing factors, including but not limited to upstream agriculture, shoreline erosion, fertilizer application, septic systems, and water flow. The subcommittee seeks to build upon various groups to partner in the endeavor to improve water quality and the health of the lakes and streams in the 14 mile watershed. Groups identified to lead the effort include the following, Lake Sherwood Property Owners Association, Lake Camelot Property Owners Association, Lake Arrowhead Property Owners Association, Pete and Well and Castle Rock Stewards, Town of Rome and the County of Adams. Certain Wisconsin state laws currently include a path equal up to 30% of a lakeside lot may be maintained for lake access. No fertilizer is to be applied on the buffer zone of 35 feet from the shoreline. State and local laws require fertilizer to be granular and phosphorus free. And all commercial applicators must have a Wisconsin pesticide and fertilizer commercial certification. The work group has assisted the town of Rome to prepare a town ordinance for lawn fertilizer application. A commitment by licensed applicators has also been drafted, whereby in return, the town of Rome will list the company on its website as a fertilizer applicator 
that has pledged to follow best practices in fertilizer application. Slide one, please. A brochure has also been developed by the subcommittee detailing healthy lakes by following rec recommended and lawful application practices. It has been mass mailed to on water property owners and also provided to the town for disbursement at the town hall. Finally, we recognize individual landowners with an award for performing healthy lake practices. What we do to our lakeshore properties has a direct effect on the quality of our lakes. Fertilizer applied at the lakeshore will run off, erode, and leach into the lake, resulting in algae blooms, some harmful to pets, people, and fish. Here are some of the examples of clean water cooperators who took the steps to have a beautiful lakefront and yard while also protecting the lake from erosion and runoff of nutrients. First slide, please. Carol and Norb Affelt had bought their existing home with a beautiful view on the narrows of Lake Sherwood in 2000 as a weekend retreat and future retirement home. On a cul-de-sac, it has the advantage of being on a point with much more water frontage than road frontage. The property offered some challenges. On a slope from the street, heavy rains resulted in a runoff of soils and fertilizer into the lake. Heavy boat action pounded the shoreline, eroding much of the bank. In 2004, working with Adams County and a highly regarded landscaping firm, they arrived at a plan for a beautiful safe yard that would be a long-term low effort solution. They reinforced the shore to eliminate erosion, planted and native plants. And along the 35 foot buffer, they built swales to reduce runoff and add no more grass than the walking paths down to the lake. They now have a beautiful lakefront friendly yard. Next slide, please. Jean and Lori Francis have been residents for many years. They noticed the changes at Lake Sherwood with more homes and weeds and less water clarity. They decided to do their part by increasing native plantings and establishing a 35 foot buffer from the water line to reduce erosion and runoff. They began simply with a $5 box of wildflower seeds from Walmart. Each year they added more plantings and native bushes and now have a beautiful 80 foot by 35 foot low effort shoreline garden that provides beauty and attracts birds and wildlife while protecting the lake from runoff and erosion. And their layout provides easy viewing from the access of their home and shoreline. There's a perfect example of a simple, low cost, yet very effective shoreline project. As they irrigate with lake water, they no longer fertilize, relying instead on the nutrients already in the lake water. Proof that you can have a beautiful yard while keeping harmful nutrients out of the lake. Next, please. Barb Harriet was the Tri Lake Secretary for many years, so she is well versed in the need to protect our lakes. Her native plantings and rain gardens along the shoreline show it. She lives at the end of Lake Camelot with a lot of wave action, so she utilizes a riprap wall to eliminate erosion. It is backed up by a series of native plant gardens that provide buffer zones against the run runoff. She's a master gardener who avoids use of fertilizer except in her container plantings. Gardens and native plants abound all over. It is a haven for wildlife, birds, and pollinators. She uses deep-rooted native plants to prevent erosion, compost to build up the soil, shreds her leaves in the fall to apply as mulch in the spring, and relies on the available nutrients in the irrigation of lake water rather than fertilizing. Further proof that you can have a beautiful lakefront home without having to add excessive nutrients that load into the lake. Next slide, please. Wendy and Dave Newsom bought their home on a large bay in Upper Camelot from Wendy's grandparents, who had it built when the lakes were first developed in the 1970s. Their lot sloped steeply towards the lake and presented issues for mowing and contributed to the runoff into the lake. The deteriorating seawall resulted in erosion at the water line. They used a landscape contractor to do the design, excavation, and planting, including aquatic species at the water line. They surrounded the pro project 
with a plant called Rattlesnake Master, which keeps the deer and geese away. Dave mows the planted area down to about six inches in the fall, and the plants come up even stronger than ever in the spring. It is a haven for birds, bees, and other pollinators, and the view of the 40, or excuse me, 20 native species in bloom is evident from their sunroom. Runoff and erosion are in check, and aquatic plants at the water's edge attracts frogs and other amphibians. It is a nice example of a low maintenance solution, an example of a project utilizing partial grant funding, much like the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. With that, I turn the program over to Scott Perdoe. Scott. Thanks, Carson. I'm gonna be talking about the nine key element plan. Next slide, please. This is a image of the Wisconsin River Basin. We're under this umbrella. This uh, river basin covers 15% uh, of the states draining through it. Next slide. How did we get here? Um, citizen group known as Packers, Pete and Well and Castle Rock Stewards had an event back in 2008 called Pontoons and Politics, where they brought the legislators to the water and showed them the color of the water. Um, that time they also asked for money to fund and start the Wisconsin River TMDL. So TMDL is uh, total maximum daily load. It's a calculation of the maximum amount of pollutants that can enter a water body so that the water body will meet and continue to meet water quality standards. Next slide. Here's uh, the TMDL then forms all these sub basins within the watershed of the Wisconsin River watershed. Next slide. Here's an image we saw before uh, showing the 14 mile uh, watershed with the uh, Lake Pekingwell being on the left part of the screen. Next slide. 50% of the watershed is uh, agricultural use. Next slide. What is a nine kilometer plan? Nine kilometer plan is it's a vehicle for funding and grants and implementation of projects to clean up the surface and groundwater within the watershed. Next slide. So that's the unique thing about the 14 mile uh, watershed nine kilometer plan. It looks at both surface and groundwater. And as pointed out before, uh, groundwater is the nit nitrogen and phosphorus is typically in the uh, surface runoff. Uh, first uh, nine kilometer plan in the state to have both groundwater and surface water component. Next slide. What is a nine kilometer plan? It's a framework for a holistic approach to improving water quality in geographical watershed. Holistic, uh, you know, all inclusive or full or complete. Um, it's going to assess the causes and sources of non-point source pollution. Non-point source pollution is, is runoff from residential, ag, uh, urban runoff, sediment from uh, poorly managed construction sites, and eroding stream banks. And also involve key stakeholders and prioritize restoration and protection strategies to address water quality. It was conditionally approved in June of last year, of 2020, with final approval uh, given in August. It expires in 2030. Next, please. Again, hats off to Case and Morley who picked up the pieces and ran this thing into the end zone for us and completed the nine key element plan, which has been approved. Uh, as mentioned before, other county cons and DNR were uh, help helpful and, and the data that John has been taking for water sampling. Next. What are the nine key elements? Causes and sources, as we mentioned, um, egg, residential, septic, and fertilizer. Uh, estimate the pollutant loading into the watershed and expected load reductions. Um, in our watershed, we'll need a 63% reduction of phosphorus to meet the TMDL. Wisconsin River TMDL site specific criteria. Described measures that uh, will be used, 
um, to reduce nutrient loading targeted amount, the BMPs will be implemented. BMPs are best management practices. A couple of those are no-till, cover crop, and filter strips. Estimate the amount of technical and financial assistance. Uh, we've heard again that uh, this is an $8 million project, a $4 million year mark for ag, $2 million for residential. And as uh, Don pointed out earlier, we just received over $250,000 for implementation and water sampling and additional 35,000 for habitat and clean boats, clean water. Develop an educational and uh, information component, which we're doing now, next slide. Um, uh, review the milestones, develop interim and then re review measurable milestones um, and then make adjustments. So if 25% of the implementation milestones are being met for each period, Periods being broken down from uh, zero to three years, three to seven years, and seven to 10 years. The plan will be evaluated and revised and to either change the milestones or to implement projects or actions to achieve the milestones that are not being met. This may also require additional uh, meetings with the public and or participants in the planned activities and then develop a monitoring component as, as we've been doing. Next. And next. So please get on the bus with us. Now I will turn the program over to Karen Konotek. Karen? Thanks, Scott, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. We're happy you're here. Hi, my name is Karen Konotek, and I live on Lake Shewitt. First thing I want to do is thank everyone for their wonderful presentations. You're all my heroes for all the countless hours you've contributed to this group. Thanks to Don for telling us about the origin of this citizen group, which by the way was his idea, and for the overview of our accomplishments. Thank you, Phil, John and Phil, for telling us about how and why testing is so incredibly important. And just so you know, they both put in tons of hours themselves. We appreciate Dave for explaining the Wisconsin DNR Healthy Lakes projects for Lakes residents. Dave spent an entire week and often spends many hours getting projects done with all the volunteers he enlists. We appreciate Carson's explanation and tireless efforts to create our fertilizer ordinances and projects and our very own clean water cooperator program. These pro programs help lake owners protect our watershed. Thanks to Scott for explaining the nine key element plan in a way we can all understand. Scott is the president of Packers, another award-winning group. So he's been working at cleaning the watershed for a long time. We're lucky to have him and all our presenters as members of this group. Thanks to everyone past and present who has given so generously of their time to make this group successful. Government advisors like Scott Provost, Kason Morley and Rachel Whitehair, who's helping us with this event today. Citizens like Barb Harride, Bob Bankowski and Rick Georgeson, to name a few. There are too many to list, but each one of these folks has a reason why they give so much of their time to this important mission. Next. You are probably wondering why there's a very handsome cat on the screen. He's my cat, Kobe, but more importantly, he's my why. He died in 2016 after a really bad blue-green algae outbreak. After owning a property on Lake Sherwood for 16 years, I knew about pets dying from drinking tainted lake water and people getting sick from the toxin and blue-green algae. But it never dawned on me that the grass we watered with lake water could actually kill my sweet cat. Kobe ate that grass and died of this waterborne toxin that grows as the water temperature rises throughout the summer. So please be careful if your pet spends time around our lakes and our watershed. That's why I'm involved. I believe that we're all responsible for the person who comes after us. So after losing my dear Kobe, I started looking for a way to get involved. At that time, it was difficult. I didn't know where to go or who to contact. So that is where I, I fit in. I work on ways to communicate and motivate. Next. First, people need to know that we exist. So we created a logo. This logo will help everyone to easily identify us. So keep an eye out for it. Next. Then we needed to get information out to you. We now have a Facebook page, 14 Mile Watershed, a website, 14milewatershed.org, newsletters, and we've even got a YouTube channel, 14 Mile Watershed Alliance, that honestly needs more of you to subscribe to it. And please follow the Facebook page and check out our website. 
We post a lot of valuable info information there and none of this works without you. Next. The next thing we did was create an event booth so you can meet us out in the community. We'll set up our booth at all the summer events around the town of Rome. Next. You'll see us at events like the Taste of Rome in April, Rome Farmer's Market, which is every Friday starting in May, the Lake Shrewd 4th of July celebration, the State of Our Lakes Lunch, which is our event on August 7th, and the Camelot Frolic, also in August, and finally, the wonderful Lake Arrowhead Craft Show in September. We'll have tons of great information and handouts for you. Along with providing answers to any questions you may have, we love talking about water, so stop by. Next. And finally, we want to engage all of you in our mission to restore the waters of our watershed. After four years of doing this, we realized that improvement can't happen unless all the people involved, called stakeholders, do their part in collaboration. That means lake owners, farmers, business owners, and anyone that lives within our watershed. Groundwater travels everywhere and everywhere it travels, it picks up pollutants before it enters our lakes and waterways. The only way to fix this huge problem is to encourage everyone to work together so that we all benefit. We intend to reach out to you, but more importantly, we wanna bring you in to become Heroes of the Watershed too. Next. Here's what you can do. I've just listed all of our social media. So a really easy thing you can do is simply keep up to date with what we're doing on the 14 Mile Watershed Alliance. Check our Facebook page or our website or our YouTube channel or read our newsletter. Just know what's going on so you'll always know what to, what to do and what not to do to help our watershed. Next. Another important thing you can do is donate. Many residents are seasonal or many of us are just really busy. So if you don't have a lot of time, this may be a way to make a real impact. Feel good in knowing that the money you give will make a big difference in restoring our watershed. Then after you donate, check out our social media to see all the good your generosity has accomplished. Next. And of course, we'd love for you to volunteer with us. Now that you know us a little, we'd love to get to know you and you can do that by giving your time. It doesn't have to be a lot, but I promise you'll have fun and it'll make you feel great. Believe me, even a few hours of your time makes a huge difference. So thanks for giving us your time today. And now we'd love to answer your questions. Back to you, Rachel. Wonderful, thank you, Karen. And thank you everybody for your phenomenal presentations. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead here and just change my view. And then we will head on to some questions that I saw come up in the chat. So the first one that I have here uh, is from Bruce and he asks, can privately owned seepage ponds qualify for a healthy lake subsidy? Um, my sense is probably not. If you go to the Healthy Lakes website, you'll see uh, there are technical guides and there are pretty specific guidelines for the design of those five practices. But that doesn't mean uh, that it might not qualify for some other type of cost share. So I would recommend uh, getting a hold of your local DNR biologist and also your county land and water conservation department. And those folks should be able to tell you uh, if there might be some other source of cost share. Um, I know that uh, our, our county conservation is working on a number of different projects and there are also a multitude of uh, other DNRs uh, what are called surface water grants, uh, in addition to what's in the Healthy Lakes program. Good deal. Thanks for that, Dave. And then we got a couple of supportive comments here. Uh, Kelly says, gorgeous homes and yards. When people start to see how nice uh, lake friendly shorelines look, they will hopefully join the movement. Yeah, I agree. Those, pow those pictures are extremely powerful. And then Rick says, this was a very inspiring presentation. It's clear to any viewer, you are each so motivated to accomplish this task. No, we all support your hard work. Wishing you the very best. Thank you, Rick. And if there are any other questions out there, uh, now is the time to voice them. Um, we do have one coming in here uh, from Jay. Uh, great work and hopefully we can do similar work on uh, Lake Wisconsin in Columbia County with the Lake Wisconsin Alliance. And I just wanted to say real quickly, 
Thanks to all of our residents and everybody who lives within the watershed for anything that they do to contribute to our mission. I know everybody cares about our water and how well we keep it since we're the stewards of it. So thanks to everybody who's here. We really appreciate you being here. Another question coming in, Sharon asks, what are average costs to redevelop a shoreline? Well, I, I, I'm doing, I don't know, I'm not sure if they're asking for a private shoreline or for a public shoreline, but um, I'm doing one of the Healthy Lakes projects with Dave. So um, it actually won't cost me anything at the end of the day because you can volunteer and that time that you put in will actually go towards your portion of what you give. Right, Dave? Maybe you can go into that. That's right. As, as far as the native plantings, especially um, the uh, rain gardens, uh, those projects, if you do the labor yourself, uh, the 75% that's covered by the DNR will essentially cover all of your costs for, for soil, for mulch, for deer fencing, for your, your plants. So um, it really, uh, in, the, in the end, ends up coming up with almost nothing out of pocket uh, for the landowner involved in one of these projects. And, and actually that's why I'm doing it because <laughs> it's going to look great at the end of the day and Dave's going to help me and he's gr he's a great expert at this and you know it's not going to cost me anything so it's going to be a great you know contribution to my shorefront also when you do these kind of projects you prevent geese from coming up on your shores you, pre you know you prevent a lot of problems that could happen when you have grass up to the shoreline so it's a really good thing to do Good deal, thank you. And then we got another question, a couple questions here. Uh, Jean asks, is the water quality improving today with the work so far? Uh, is it noticeable? The water quality uh, has uh, definitely improved. We're not seeing a major change in uh, coloration uh, in sediment. Uh, basically, we are still in the uh, data collecting mode uh, where we'll be able to pinpoint some sources and actually work with uh, uh, people that uh, have the ability to affect the water quality. Uh, so the, I guess the, the baseline answer here is, is that uh, we're still in the um, select uh, the um, parameters mode. And then uh, Tamas asks, I'm curious if the fish sticks provide benefits to the watershed beyond healthy fish habitat. Dave, can you add to that at all? Um, well, the, the other main major benefit is they certainly offer shoreline protection. So they reduce reduce erosion and they also reduce uh, impacts from uh, from uh, shoreline boating or, or just wind action of, of waves on the shoreline. So, the, so they do break up uh, that, that wave action. So they do offer that protection in addition to uh, being great for fish habitat. Thanks for that. And then uh, Sharon was asking who the contact for the shoreline project is. I think she's talking about Pam Toshner. If you could put that that uh, information into the chat, Dave, that would be helpful. Uh, and Eric says fish sticks also support dragonflies and other insects that prey on mosquitoes. Ooh, definitely a good thing. All right. Any other questions out there? Keep them coming. I'm curious, uh, I hear you guys have some, some stickers available with your awesome logo. How, how could someone get a hold of one of those? Well, I can tell you that they can um, send an email to 14milewatershed at gmail.com and we'll make sure that they get a sticker for sure. And um, I don't, this, I had it on one of my slides, but it's, it's a really nice looking sticker. It's like four by four and we, we're happy to send them out. We can send you multiple ones if you'd like it. But any way that you can show your support, even by posting a sticker on your, you know, on your door or someplace that where, pe where people can see it, that's really wonderful. We really appreciate it. Good deal. And oh, it, Lynn says the Rome Public Library has some of the stickers. Awesome. Karen, I'm sure you probably had a, a hand in dropping those off. Actually, I'm going to drop off more now. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then Kelly wonders, uh, have you used biologs? Um, there has been an occasional project that uses biologs. Um, it's not a practice that's covered under the Healthy Lakes Grant program, but that's another one of those things that often you can get cost share through your county land and water conservation or through a, another DNR service grant uh, application. Uh, Dave, can I add to your comment, please? You can hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. All right. Um, I would, uh, if you think back to uh, one of the properties that was shown uh, was the Newsom's, uh, Wendy and Dave Newsom. And if you notice, they had a really steep embankment. And um, you might recall that uh, when Carson was talking about it, their shoreline had pretty much eroded away. Uh, they had had uh, probably railroad ties, which used to be legal uh, back in the day. And uh, so they replaced that and they graded it. And what they put in was um, a series of uh, just natural sticks and uh, they used anchors and then they, they implanted various aquatic plants within that so they could establish a root system. And so they did that because uh, the um, uh, core logs weren't really supported by the grant program. And so what happened with them is that uh, the roots then uh, dug into the shoreline. And uh, so they established their own uh, shoreline and they did that without the use of car logs. So it's possible to do that. Uh, personally, uh, with my own lot, I live on a, a point uh, at the main body, between the main body of lake and a channel. And um, I had rip rot uh, for half of the uh, property and the other half, I never put anything in and had grass and just like a lot of people did and uh, lost about three feet of shoreline. And so what I did uh, two years ago, I did a Healthy Lakes project for 70 feet of that frontage. And um, so I, I chose to use sedges. And what I did is I anchored sedges down into the water line and they've got a really strong root system. And so that should establish the bank for me. So there are a lot of options that you can use with the Healthy Lakes program to uh, stabilize the shoreline bank. Thank you. Thanks, Don. And then we got another question from Dick. He asks, does cost sharing apply to Lake Arrowhead? Uh, we don't own at the lake. That would be Dave. Dave, can they do that uh, because they don't own the last 75 feet going down to the lake? Oh. Dave, I think you're, you're still muted. Yep, there he goes. Okay, yeah, my back. On. Um, yes, what I've done on Lake Arrowhead is um, I've actually helped the landowner go to the association and ask for permission to work in that uh, area that's technically owned by the association. So, so there is a way to do that, and they've been very supportive of uh, doing plantings and, and rain gardens and stuff in that in that area that's actually association owned well, uh, by by the adjacent landowner. So basically that's Lake Arrowhead is the, the landowner. Is yes, right? yes. Lake Arrowhead of the three lakes is, is the only one that has that situation. So Dick, so can Dick get a hold of you and get those details worked out? Sure, sure. All right. And then uh, I was wondering how do folks get a hold of one of the clean water cooperator signs? Well, um, I can explain that program. And uh, I think the easiest way to get hold of it, our central point of contact is Karen Kanotek. And I think she had put up her email address before. Uh, what we ask is that um, we'll give you the sign for free. What we ask you to do is to sign a form. It's non-binding. It's not a legal document. But what we ask you to do is to commit to follow the fertilizer ordinance that we worked with uh, for the town of Rome. And it, it uh, relates to the 35-foot um, uh, buffer that Carson had explained. And also it um, uh, relates to the number of uh, fertilizer or uh, applications you would do during a year. So we're just asking you to be a responsible landowner and uh, for that uh, agreement, we'll give you a sign. I would encourage that to be done because the more signs we get out, it's more uh, appealing to the other landowners that they do the same thing and that they cooperate. So 
Uh, if you want to sign Shirley get it and we'd like to have it posted by the lake or in front of your house we do encourage that so good deal all right we are at a two o'clock mark so i'm going to let everybody go here um, thank you all so much for joining us next up is the portage county lakes and rivers alliance so hop on over to that one if you're able um, i see michael does have a question here so michael if you're still on we can address your question before we head out um, so he asks, what about mechanical means of removing phosphorus i've heard mention of it so I'll uh, answer that, uh, Rachel. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean exactly by mechanical means, but uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, at this point, uh, we're uh, not in the removal process other than uh, the programs that we have for our lake owners and uh, uh, suggestions for upstream uh, agriculturalists. However, uh, I would also tell you that we have a flow through system here and mechanical means uh, uh, is probably not going to be uh, a viable uh, uh, result or a viable um, uh, action that will take place uh, to, re uh, to get rid of the phosphorus. Uh, the water flows through and it's replaced by fresh water with more phosphorus. Mm. Hey, John. Yeah. Can I, can I just say, yeah, we're, we're focused more on source control versus grabbing the stuff that's in the lakes. And that's kind of what John was saying. So that's that's where the focus is. And, and with the 9 km one plan, we'll be able to implement practices that will reduce source loading. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, absolutely. Turning off that faucet instead of uh, throwing towels on the spill, right? Exactly. And the other thing I would like to say is um, where it's good to, to, to do, you know, things, short-term solutions, they really don't work for the long-term. So it might help, help for a day or two. And also we have a lot more nitrate issues than we have phosphorus issues. So that's another thing you want to keep in mind, but um, it's not the long-term issue. And that's what we're really working at. All righty. Seeing no other questions coming in, I think we will call it for today. A wonderful job, everybody. And again, thanks all for, for, for everyone who hopped on today. Thanks. Thanks for attending. Thanks, Rachel, Thank and for all the attendees. Take care, all. Water is life. Good day, all.